Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Chef AJ live. And how are you today? I have a wonderful guest for you. He actually said he knew who I was, but I did not know who he was until he actually reached out to me. And I'm so glad he did because he's a cardiologist. He's been board certified in cardiology for 25 years. But for the past three years, he has been also board certified in lifestyle medicine. So he's going to talk about how to reverse heart disease and other chronic diseases of lifestyle like obesity and type 2 diabetes and things like that. And I got to tell you something. He has one of the best names in the whole world. His first name is <laughs> the same as mine. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. please welcome Dr. A.J. Shaw. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Of course. Thank you, Chef AJ. Like I said, I've been following your journey for many years. You've been a really a great, great pioneer in uh, how to combine, in my opinion, the most important pillar of nutrition in healthy lifestyle. So I think uh, we needed people like you in healthy lifestyle movement who can actually who can actually teach people how to cook healthy meals. Because like Dr. Michael Greger says that Cooking skill is the most important survival skill. So you actually merge cooking skill with a great knowledge about how the healthy lifestyle should be. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, because I remember once talking to Dr. Colin Campbell and we were saying, you know, the science is great, but you can't eat the science. Yes, exactly, exactly. So you've been a cardiologist for 25 years. What got you interested in a plant-based diet and treating your patient, patients with a plant-based diet? So, you know, as a cardiologist, I was always more into prevention, but my preventative cardiology was more of a standard medication base. So for example, whenever I saw a patient with high cholesterol, I gave them statin. So that was my standard way of treating high cholesterol. I was into some into healthy eating, some into exercise, but my go-to thing was typically prescribing a statin. And over the years, I started to realize that statin would bring down the LDL, the bad cholesterol, but many times the events, the heart attacks will keep happening. Many times their weight will keep going up. Many times their markers of inflammation, many times they will become diabetic. So statin wasn't doing anything except lowering their LDL. And on top of it, half of the patient, as the research, as the data says, half of the patient were stopping their statin at one year because statin did not make them feel good. Statin actually just lowered the LDL while, you know, and plus on top of it, a lot of patients had a side effects from statin. So I start to look for like what else is available, what we can do other than the statin. And that's where I came across this uh, great research from obviously Dan Ornish, from Michael Greger, from Joe Furman. And I start to realize that those things not only have a equal, if not more powerful effects on cholesterol, but they are without any side effects. Right. They're obviously free. That doesn't cost anything. And actually it has a tremendous amount of, I call it good side effects, which is essentially improving your uh, sleep, improving your mood, losing weight, improving your joint pains. So I think that's when I realized that I think the best way I can help my patients for reversing their heart disease to promote healthy lifestyle. And that's where I got into American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And matter of fact, I took the lifestyle boards two and a half years ago and passed the boards with the, you know, the great uh, grades. And uh, since then, I've been really, really big promoter. And to be honest with you, actually, not only I'm enjoying, because when I talked to the patients before, it was very boring, dry talk. I think many doctors don't agree at times, but prescribing medicine is one of the most boring thing to do in my opinion. I think when you talk about healthy eating, when you talk about what they like to eat, how they exercise, what their relationships are, how they sleep, those things are more exciting. It more makes you like a friend. Like writing a Lipitor doesn't make me their friend. While talking about their lifestyle almost instantly makes me their friend. And they also feel like, I care more about their whole life than just their cholesterol or their blood pressure. And that's how I think I got, I got really big into lifestyle medicine. Matter of fact, most of my patients now are doing so much great with help of lifestyle changes instead of just taking the medication. My rate of cardiac catheterization, where we do the procedure to fix the heart blockage has significantly gone down. So this, uh, this uh, healthy lifestyle is not only beneficial, but in terms of uh, health, but in terms of cost saving also, 
And we have a lot of data, obviously, from the Ornish, many of the recent data that people who change their lifestyle not only need less medicine, but need less stents and less bypass surgery. You know, I love what you said about the patients that you were prescribing statins to maybe took them for a year because although it lowered the number, it made them feel terrible. And you can almost say that for lots of the medicine that, that people are giving, whether it's psychiatric medicine or, or diabetes medicine, it, it often resolves certain symptoms, but it doesn't change the way they feel often or the underlying disease. I 100% I agree with you. And I think, uh, I think that's where medications may be a bridging thing. And I think that's okay. We prescribe medicine. Medicines have their role. But I don't think the role of medicine should be a primary role. The primary role should be lifestyle changes. And as people, people go on the journey of lifestyle, it may take them few months, few years to achieve the lifestyle goals. In the meantime, you can do a procedure, you can prescribe a statin, whatever necessary, but ultimate goal is no medicine, no procedure. That makes sense. I was listening to a podcast you did and you mentioned the six pillars of health. And when I listened to them, I thought, these are also the six killers of health. Exactly, exactly. I think uh, we, don't, uh, we don't appreciate many times, but most chronic disease, are made in our kitchen and in our gym. Most chronic disease actually are man-made or woman-made. They are not made by our genes. Actually, heart disease, the genetic role of the heart disease is very small. It's our lifestyle. So when you apply those six pillars, our College of Lifestyle Medicine was very astute enough to include all the pillars instead of just saying that you need to eat healthy because many times healthy eating has to go hand in hand with exercise, with sleep, with stress management, with relationship. And as we know now, the people who live long and live healthy for a long, healthy health span, they actually do all the pillars. They don't smoke, they sleep well, they go to church, you know, they go to temple. They do a lot of things together. And as you as you know well, Chef AJ, that seven day Adventist group in San Diego area has followed has been following. So so many times people said that it's very hard to make those lifestyle changes, but we have just within our own country where people live their whole life with those six pillars. So it's not very hard. When you talk about blue zones in Okinawa, sometimes many patients, many Americans tell me that, well, it's in Japan, it's in Okinawa. How about in America? It's very hard. We are all stressed out. We have fast paced life. We work long hours. We have two jobs. How can we do that? I say, if San Diego, if seven day advances can the whole country can do it, why not we do it? So I don't think it's hard once you explain them that other people are doing it. Great. You know, there's so many questions, uh, Dr. AJ. Uh, may I ask you some of them? Of course, anytime. Yes. Go oh, ahead. Terrific. Then, but please, and always feel free to talk about anything you want. Lori says, Dr. Esselstyn says that if our cholesterol is under 150, we are heart attack proof. Do you agree with that? Yes, in general, I agree with it. Actually, the same thing was said, and I think Dr. Essence will pick it up from a physician named Robert Roberts from Baylor. And he actually said the same thing, that if your LDL, the bad cholesterol, is below 70, you would be heart attack proof. So I agree, keeping the cholesterol low, obviously there are exceptions to every rule. I think in general, if you keep your total cholesterol below 150, I think you will have very, very low chance of heart attack. That's fantastic. Susan says that she's been whole food plant-based only since 2014, but she still needs a statin to bring down her cholesterol. She tried without it for a month, but her cholesterol went from 160 to 206. I thought it wasn't so much the number, but the diet that you ate that's more important. Is that, should we be freaking out about a number that, that's higher than one? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very valid and very common question because we just talked about keeping the cholesterol below 150. So if your cholesterol is 206, obviously you would think that to bring it down to 150, you have to do something more than diet. At the same time, I personally feel that if your diet is not bringing cholesterol down below 150, you could tweak the diet more. And I'm sure she is following whole food, plant-based, no oil diet. But I think maybe there could be component of extra calories she needs to lower. Maybe there could be component of improving her HDL and the ratio. So I think I would look at the breakdown instead of just two or six. I would look at the marker of inflammation. If you if you remember, a lot of the patients who have uh, 
no evidence of any heart blockage. Their cholesterol is around 200, but their marker of inflammation, HSCRP, is actually very low and very normal. And in my patients, if their HSCRP is normal, they are following a whole food, plant-based, no oil diet, then sometimes I left their cholesterol up to about 180, 190 with a full assurance to them that they probably will be okay. So I think 206, slightly high, but 180, 170, I think with diet, I would stay there. I don't think we need to bring everybody below 150, as long as the marker of inflammation is low or normal. She said that her CRP is low. That's a, that's, a, that's a great feeling. I think if her CRP is low, then 206, work with the diet. If you want to take statin, I'm not against statin. I still prescribe statin. And if you can tolerate statin without any side effect, now there are pretty much no cost, $5 a month. Long term, there are typically no side effects. So if you stay on statin, I wouldn't be against it. If your marker of inflammation is low, if you can bring it down to 170, 180 without statin, that would be fine too. But I think if you maintain it, when, when we talk about statin, sometimes people have, doctors have said that uh, statin sometimes can cause type 2 diabetes. As long as you are on a very low dose statin, like lipid or 10 milligram or Pavacol, Pavastatin, 20 or 40 milligram, chances of diabetes uh, happening is very low. With your cholesterol number, two or six, you probably need a very low dose statin. That's great. Patty Jean says, can you comment on CRP levels? Maybe you could just explain what CRP is and is this something we should get tested like if we have a physical every year? Yes, yes. So CRP stands for C-reactive protein. And we also have now high sensitive CRP, which is the which is the same kind of CRP, but it's more specific for inflammation in the blood vessels or the arteries. So again, CRP is actually been around been tested around for almost 15 years. That was a major trial done by Paul Ritker from Boston, who actually said that CRP should be considered as important as LDL. And he did a study, a trial, for people who had a normal or low CRP level, LDL up to 130 was okay. So CRP has been really proven now. And if you remember the cover page uh, on the Time magazine, the chronic inflammation is the killer. And now we know chronic inflammation has been uh, proposed into not just heart disease and heart blockage, but also into type 2 diabetes and Alzheimer's disease, many cancers, many other inflammatory disorders. So I think chronic inflammation has become as important as some of the numbers of cholesterol or even for that sake, the sugar and other things. So I'm glad she has a good normal level of CRP. That gives me assurance that there is no chronic inflammation going on. When we look at the HSCRP level or Let's talk about CRP level. When we talk about CRP level, when the level is above three, that's high. When the level is two to three, it's medium or slightly high. And below one is considered low or normal. So I expect if her CRP level is below one, she's in a good position, she's in a good situation. So that's a great news. I think many times I tell my patients that if their CRP level is normal, I give them a lot of credit because CRP is almost like a, like a thread on the tire. If people are bad drivers, I can tell them they're bad drivers by looking at the thread on the tire because they will be worn out pretty quickly because they're putting brakes all the time, they're rushing all the time. Same if your CRP level is normal, you're doing something right for your lifestyle. That's terrific. Uh, let's see, Carol says, can you discuss best way to avert the damage from very high IPA? Are you finding you can reverse the effects of this with the plant-based diet? Is she talking about lipoprotein A? I, uh, I asked her to please clarify. I think, I think she meant oh yeah, L. It's, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on. LPA, not yeah, IPA. Yeah, Excuse yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's a that's a great question. Lipoprotein A has been now investigated and studied for almost last 30 years. Lipoprotein A is a molecule which is behaves like an LDL, the bad cholesterol, and it almost has a similar characteristics as an LDL, except. It has the same kind of molecular structure as a plasminogen. So plasminogen is the molecule which helps you to lyse or to break down the clot. And if you understand that heart attack typically starts when the clot in the plaque, uh, clot happens at the plaque. And that's when the clot blocks the whole vessel. So lysing or breaking down the clot becomes very important. People who have a high level of lipoprotein A, somehow they have a inability to lice or to break down this clot. And that's the reason 
lipoprotein it not only promotes the heart blockage, but it also promotes heart attack by not able to break down the clot. So high levels of lipoprotein A has been an independent risk factor. Fortunately, only about 10 to 15% 10 of Americans have high lipoprotein A and it's genetically mediated. So you need to check it only once. If your lipoprotein A level is normal once, it's always gonna be normal. So you don't have to check it again and again, like we check the cholesterol. So just check one time lipoprotein A and see what it is. The typical levels uh, are below 20. If your level is above 50, then it's considered high. Above 100 is considered very high. So if your lipoprotein A level is above 50, then we need to do something about it. In the past, in the about 10 years ago, we used to prescribe niacin, niacin, which had lower the lipoprotein A. But since the niacin has gone out of fashion because there was a study done where niacin or niacin did not make any difference in terms of heart disease and heart attacks. So we don't prescribe that much niacin, but niacin or niacin can lower lipoprotein A. Other thing we have learned now that people who have high level of lipoprotein A, if you keep their LDL, the bad cholesterol, below 50, the importance of lipoprotein A almost gets negated. And now the most recent information within last one year, that we have a possibly new drug coming out, which actually works through genetic modification, and I think that will lower lipoprotein A. So that will be a godsend because if we can lower the lipoprotein A, that would be an additional way of preventing heart attack. Right. You know, I'd like you to just comment on what all of our numbers should be, because, you know, this question from Patty Jean, she says her cholesterol is 129, HDL 50, LDL 70, triglycerides 46. Why is my LDL lower than the LDL? Because I think when you, when you eat a plant-based diet and you have a doctor that's not plant-based, they're always trying to tell you to raise, raise your HDL, but when your cholesterol's no, I mean, I exercise a lot, I eat perfectly, and there's like, oh, your HDL is too low. It's not too low, it's just you've never seen a normal patient before. I think that's an that's a excellent point. And I think many physicians, like you said, who are not plant-based have not seen the cholesterol numbers who are very lean, who eat very healthy, whole plant-based diet. And many times, actually, the ratio is the one which is more important. So for example, if somebody's cholesterol is 150, and if their HDL is, HDL is 50, the ratio is three, which is pretty acceptable ratio. I think I would definitely look out for the ratio. And there are some data that independently, if you have very low HDL, there are higher chance of heart blockage and heart attacks. But I think in general, the most recent data says that HDL actually is not as important as the Framingham data said. Actually, now we pretty much depend upon the LDL. And the most recent information actually pretty much says that you don't need to worry about the low HDL. Like I used to have low HDL. My HDL has almost doubled in the last three years since I've been, you know, my own lifestyle, uh, you know, what, what I talk, I should walk. So my HDL almost has doubled now, but my LDL has come down significantly on whole food plant-based diet. So to answer her question, if her LDL is below 100, and if she doesn't have any known heart blockage, then she's in a good position. If she has a known blockage, if she ever had any heart event, I call it, with heart attack or stroke or leg blockage, then LDL should be below 70 and preferably below 50. And that can be achieved with whole food, plant-based, no oil diet. Terrific. The way it was, see, because I'm not a doctor, so I need things sometimes described in layman's terms, but the way it was described to me is the HDL is like the garbage trucks, but if you don't have any garbage, you don't need garbage trucks. Yes, I agree with you. I think HDL does the reverse cholesterol transport, which essentially is picking up the garbage, which is the LDL from the plaque bringing to the liver. So I agree, HDL's job is to bring the bad cholesterol back to the liver. But like you said, if you don't have a high LDL, you don't need high HDL. But once again, HDL is almost out of the equation right now. I gotta tell you, you'll appreciate this. I, this. There's not many other people I can brag about this too, but I was in a very serious car accident. I was hit head on by a new driver. My car was totaled. And I, I, I don't remember if it was an MRI or a CAT scan, but whatever they did to me, they were. it wasn't to look at my carotid arteries, but the carotid arteries were part of the test. Yes. And the doctor said he's never seen arteries that had no plaque, that there was wow. nothing. They were like, I've been vegan 43 wow. years. They were like, wow. why? He says, I don't understand. I've never wow. seen anything like this before. No, I think that's a, that's a testament to what you say, you follow, 
And I think uh, I think it's a, such a great feeling when you get a some parameter, some way knowing that how you are doing. And that's the reason I tell many times my patients that numbers, when you follow your cholesterol, when you follow your carotid uh, intimal thickness, when you follow calcium scoring in the coronary arteries, those things, even though sometimes cost a small amount of money, but it gives me an assurance that what I'm doing is working. Many times, doctors are not able to give that assurance because they've said that, well, you are not any medicine, how can you be doing great? But I think to me, a lot of doctors still don't understand the whole food, plant-based, no oil diet, absolutely reverses. So even if somebody had a mild plaque buildup, it will be reversed. Well, let's see. So we have a question from Patty. She wants to know if there's hope. She says she had a procedure, a TAVR, yes, and yes. it looks like she had three stents. She's overweight, yes, yes. looks like she's 79, and she wants yes. to know if there's still hope. Oh, of course, there are great hopes. There are great hopes. I think uh, TAVR, fortunately, has a very long time uh, success rate. The valves will stay open. The stands also actually have a very long time success rate. I think her main mission, her main mission should be to be as preventative as she can. That means taking her medication, what her doc doctor had prescribed, because after stents, you will need to be on certain medications to prevent the clot formation at the stand, like aspirin and many times other kind of blood thinners. She may need to be on certain other medications, including statin, because she already has a heart blockage in stents. But her main emphasis is going to be on a whole food, plant-based, no oil diet, regular exercise, and even she's 79, the trick I use in my patients, when I see a 79-year-old, I ask them that walk five minutes in your house every hour. Because right now with COVID-19, we all are in our house. Sometimes we go out to walk, but just walk five minutes in your house every hour in the largest, most empty room. And do it every hour since you wake up. If you do that all day, that's one hour of walking. You don't need more than that. If she does that, I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that one hour of walking every day, if you remember the Dean Ornish data, they only walk 30 minutes three times a week. If she does one hour walking every day, she will be in a great shape. So again, taking her medications, following whole food, plant-based diet, regular walking, start with five minutes every hour, just get up every hour, get a kitchen timer, set a timer every hour for five minutes. Fourth thing, having a good sleep, having a group relationship, going to her church, going to her temple, wherever she goes, and having a low stress in life. That means doing some meditation, doing some what I call pranayam, which is a breathing exercise, and keeping essentially stress low and keeping the overall happiness in life high. Because we don't realize heart disease happens not just because of what we eat, but what else we do with our body. Absolutely. Here's a question I hear a lot from Asia. She says, is there such a thing is too low cholesterol. Someone said to me the cholesterol under 150 would be detrimental to the brain, high risk of dementia. Could that be true? I actually had dinner once with Dr. David Perlmutter who wrote Grain Brain. We were both speaking at a spa called Rancho La Puerta in Mexico. And yes. they don't really use very much oil there. And you have to ask for oil if you want it. And he offered me some for my greens. I said, no, I'm sorry, I don't need oil. He goes, why? And I explained to him, he goes, he goes, what's your cholesterol? I go 99. He goes, oh, you're gonna get dementia then. So. So far, I haven't. Yeah. No, I think uh, that's a policy, in my opinion. That's a myth. You know, there are some data. I think some data from Japan. The people who are ultra low cholesterol, sometimes there is slightly high risk of hemorrhage in the brain. And that's the reason some doctors have been concerned. But if you ask me, my opinion, I think cholesterol around 120 to 150 probably is ideal. And some of the argument, what I like to make is that when a newborn is born, the LDL actually is 50, 30 to 50. So unless they are genetically high, but average newborns LDL is ultra low. And despite of that, most newborns grow up, most newborns grow up with a great brain. Most newborns grow up with a normal brain function. They go to school, they go to college. So I think their argument that too low cholesterol is bad for the brain is not true. Thank you for saying that. Carol wants to know where you stand on nuts. 
she says that she has probable blockages and has been plant-based no oil since February 7th, has lost 15 pounds and gone off blood pressure medications, do take statins and fibrate. She wonders whether it's best to nut or not to nut. That is the question. <laughs> no, I think uh, nut in general, in my opinion, is good. Nut carries a lot of calorie. It's a calorie dense food. So if you are in process of losing weight, if you already had a significant heart blockages, and if you are trying to lower your weight and your cholesterol significantly, then like Dr. Asselson says, sometimes you can avoid nut. In my opinion, nut should be always part of your meal, part of your diet. Have only one ounce of nut, and the nuts I recommend is walnuts. There's also some data that if you take one Brazil nut once or twice a month, that lowers your LDL actually. So nuts definitely plays a role in our diet. I would ask her to be on one ounce of nuts per day, no more than that. If she's trying to lose weight, maybe half an ounce, but I would definitely have ounce, uh, ounce of nut in my diet. And then I take one to two Brazil nut a month to keep my LDL low. So yes, nuts should be part of our diet. If you, all of us know Dr. Joe Furman, he's like my favorite person. In his book, nuts are must. Even people who want to lose weight, one ounce of nuts are must. Yeah, that didn't work for me, Doc. But I got to tell you, I have a lot of people that are food addicts and you give them one nut and they eat the whole bag. I know. I think if you're not disciplined, then just go without the nuts. I agree with you. I think, How about uh, just having some flax or chia seeds like Dr. Russell said? I think I agree. I think uh, flax or chia seeds are fine too. They're all calorie dense, but flax or chia seeds are fine too. Yes. Great. Louise says I, to you, I love that you work with your patients so that they re remain in control of their lives as they actually heal, not develop new problems from side effects of medication. So that's a very nice compliment. When Thank did you. you first go plant-based? Is your family plant-based? Where did you hear about it? Thank you. Yeah, I grew up in India. So my parents were always vegetarian. We had a dairy or milk-based products, but we never ate meat. So we were always vegetarian. When I came to America, I remained vegetarian. Uh, about three years back, I went, I became vegan. So I, I'm not 100% vegan. If I go out with friends and if they have a pizza with cheese, I don't become an oddball. I would have a slice of pizza with cheese. But typically at our home, we don't use any dairy. So I'm pure vegan. Uh, I think uh, there are tremendous benefits of being vegan. At the same time, I must caution people. That I call them, there are dirty vegans too. Because if you look at a lot of the processed food, they are vegan foods, but they are, they are not a healthy vegan food. So all vegans actually don't do well. And unfortunately, I hate to report that, but in India, many of the people who are vegetarian and vegan, they've gone into a lot of the processed food. As a matter of fact, the heart disease and heart attack risk and their event rate, number of heart attacks actually has gone up. So despite of them being vegan and vegetarian, they still develop a lot of heart blockage. So I think vegan doesn't mean all healthy. It has to be whole food, plant-based with no oil. And that's what the Seventh-day Adventist people in San Diego area do. They are whole food, plant-based. So to be honest with you, American vegan is healthier than Indian vegan. <laughs> thank you. You know, I thank you for saying no oil because there's a new surge of, of vegan doctors that are saying no oil is okay for heart disease and, and vegan keto is good. And so thank you for saying what most of us believe. So I appreciate yes. that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, terrific. So how do you work with your patients? Do they, you, I'm sure they're just regular people. And then do you come in and hit them over the head with the <laughs> prevent and reverse heart disease or how, what, yeah. what's your way of approaching it? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the thing uh, I like with them always is that I, I never stand and talk. I always sit down and talk. That immediately makes them feel that I have tons of time in my practice. I'm not in rush, number one. Many times I would give them a hug if they achieve some goal of their healthy lifestyle. Obviously with COVID-19, hugs are gone, which I kind of miss it, but that's okay. A lot of our phone calls are video calls now. But my, see, when we took our lifestyle boards, we all realized that doctors are great scientists, but they're very lousy coach. Because when you want to change the lifestyle, it requires a lot of coaching. A matter of fact, there are, including yourself, Chef AJ, I think uh, there are a lot of people who are not doctors, but they're a great health coach. And the results on their clients, their patients, actually is a lot more, almost 
10 times better than many doctors who are not good coach. So I have taken up this mission on becoming not just a doctor, not just a scientist, but also a coach. And coach means holding their hand, following your own advice to yourself, uh, comforting them when they are slightly going off track and getting bringing them back on the track. And I think all those things will require a lot of long-term relationship. And I think many times, many patients, unfortunately, will not follow what you say. And instead of becoming a bitter about it, just like when a mom keeps asking son, I give this example to my patients all the time. But when a kid comes to mom and says, I don't want to go to school, first thing mom will say, son or daughter, you should go to school because school is good for you. And he says, no, I don't want to go to school. Well, you should go to school. Otherwise, you will not get dinner tonight. Well, I don't want to go to school. Mom is going to keep trying to pursue with all the means of making sure the kid goes to school. Same way, I think as a physician, my role is to work with every kind of patients with every kind of arguments they have about healthy lifestyle. To give you an example, one patient came and said that, I love my burgers. You know, I said, why do you love burgers? Because burger doesn't love you back. Why do you love your burgers? And he says, because whenever I eat burgers, it reminds me the way my dad used to take me to a burger place. So it gives me an instant memory back of my dad. So we came out with an, a different kind of way of remembering. I said, you have grandkids. Yes, he said, yes, I have grandkids. I said, take your grandkids to a whole food plant-based restaurant, create a new memory, that you will be able to see their grandkids' graduation, their wedding with them if you eat whole food plant-based diet. So I was asking him to not delete the memory, but replace the memory with a grandkids' memory with a new healthier eating habit. And he immediately said, yeah, it makes sense because I have my dad's memory, but I want to have my grandkids, my memory also. And I think he changed. So I think many times this requires a lot of diplomacy, a lot of thinking, a lot of planning. And many doctors, unfortunately, the reason doctors cannot do whole food life, whole food plant-based, no oil diet and lifestyle, because number one, doctors don't have knowledge. Many doctors from my time, we had like almost zero out of nutrition training. We did not have any lifestyle training. Number two, doctors don't do themselves. You know, doctors become lousy lifestyle patients themselves. Many doctors are obese. Many doctors don't exercise. They are stressed out. Many of them have depression. They don't sleep well. They have substance abuse, including alcohol. Many doctors don't have enough time. You know, when we see patients, we get about 10 or 15 minutes. And to cover a whole lifestyle requires half an hour. And sometimes, to be honest with you, doctors don't get paid to do lifestyle medicine. That's changing because Dean Ornish was extremely, uh, extremely hard work and astute enough to approve the lifestyle change for cardiac rehab. So now we get paid to put people through cardiac rehab. So again, many doctors still are coming on board. The lifestyle medicine field is growing growing rapidly now. Actually, many, many doctors at my hospital are asking me constantly, how can they be lifestyle certified? So I see a hope. I see people are changing. I see doctors are changing. One day our Medicare, one day our insurance companies will change and they will start paying people for counseling, people for coaching. And that's what I think we will reverse is chronic disease, including diabetes and high blood pressure. And to be honest with you, diabetes is a very low hanging fruit. Type two diabetes, if you do the lifestyle change, you can reverse your type two diabetes in six weeks. You know, some people could be on insulin for 10 years, they can be off insulin in six years. You know, Dr. Neil Barnard, who was on your show, Neil Barnard, he shows, he has proven that you can actually go off your insulin in six weeks. And when, I, when I'm done with patients, they absolutely get, you know, they get tears in their eyes with the happiness that, oh, I'm not on insulin anymore. That's incredible. I know that sleep is one of your six pillars. Yes. And we have a question from Susan, how many hours of sleep do you suggest? And do you have any tips on, on getting good sleep? Because that seems to be- yeah, sleep is my favorite subject. Actually, sleep is my favorite subject. So we need seven to eight hours of sleep. 30% of Americans, 30% of Americans don't get seven hours. So it's a very high number. And almost 10 to 15% hour, of Americans get five hours or less sleep. So seven hours is minimum, number one. Number two, you need to track your sleep. Because unless you know how much sleep you are getting, how would you know you're sleeping enough or not? So you need to, in my opinion, they need to invest into a very low cost device, like a Fitbit or many other device, which you can wear it at night. 
And in the morning, it will tell you how your sleep was. It will tell you how your deep sleep was, how your RAM sleep was, how your light sleep was. It will give you an average for the week. So again, seven hours, not Americans are enough sleeping for the hours. A lot of Americans are on sleeping medicine. Almost 4% of Americans are on sleeping medicine. And sleeping medicine now has shown now the people who take sleeping medicine, they live less, very high mortality. So sleeping medicine is not the way to improve your sleep. So let's see how can you improve sleep. Very important question, in my opinion, as important as eating healthy and exercising. Because sleep, without sleep, you will have an increased appetite, you will eat more. When we all have experience whenever we did not sleep at night, next day we ate three to 500 more calories. And those calories were very unhealthy, cookies and ice creams and other things. So sleep increases your appetite. Sleep obviously makes you more prone to have accidents. Without sleep, you can become pre-diabetic and diabetic. Without sleep, even if there's some data, some cancer rate goes up. Without sleep, you don't live long enough. People who sleep on a regular, normal hours live long. But sleep definitely has a proven, proven benefits. So what can we do? Number one, have a fixed sleep hours. So throughout all seven days, if you go to sleep at 10 o'clock, wake up at six, do that every day. Once in a while, if you break that rule, that's fine. But you cannot sleep, you know, late two, three nights a week and think that you will catch up on the weekend, number one. Number two, exercise 30 minutes before two o'clock every day. Exercise has been very important in improving sleep. So if you're not exercising, just go for a simple walk. Number three, get in the sunlight. If you can get 30, 20 to 30 minutes of sunlight in the morning, then your sleep will improve. And if you are not able to get in the sunlight because you live in a, you know, Michigan or other states, then you can buy actually 10,000 lux lights, and expose yourself to the 10,000 lux lights in the morning for 20 to 30 minutes. Number four, keep your bedroom temperature 66 degrees. When we lower your core temperature, your deep sleep improves, your sleep improves. Number five, uh, uh, don't have any caffeine after 2 p.m. And if you're very sensitive, not have any caffeine after the morning coffee. Number seven, um, wear very light clothes because if you wear light clothes, your core temperature will be lower and you will sleep better. Number eight, obviously remove all the blue lights in the evening. So after 7 p.m., try to avoid phones, iPads, TV as much as you can. If you absolutely have to look at your phone or look at your iPad, get a blue light blocker so that way your blue light exposure will be less. Number nine, obviously keep your bedroom very dark. Uh, no TV in the bedroom for sure. Uh, use the bed only for sleeping and for sex. And that brings the next point that people who are partner, people who are married, definitely sex improves your sleep. So do it as often as you can, as often as you want. Um, I think all those things are tips. In my opinion, sleep is a science. If you follow the science, your sleep will improve and you will not need a medicine. I tell my patients that I cannot make you younger. I cannot make you energetic unless I work with you for six months. But if I can give you one night of good sleep, you will be energetic and younger next day. So sleep can improve you within 24 hours. People who are chronically sleep deprived, if they have one good night's sleep, next day they feel like a new person. If you eat healthy one day, you will not feel like a new person. If you exercise one day, you will not feel like a new person. But if, if you improve your sleep just one night, you feel great, great next day. Your creativity goes up, your productivity goes up, your, your boss likes you, your wife likes you, your husband likes you. Sleep is one of the most important things. That's wonderful. Wait, wait, you, you blew me away when you said keep your environment at 66 degrees. I live in the desert and we keep our place at about 80 because it's about 100 outside. I mean, I think I would freeze at 66. Yeah, I think, uh, I think obviously you have to do the best where you live. But if you look at the data, 66 is the ideal temperature for sleep. I don't know. I just, yeah. <laughs> I think because you're from Detroit, you could probably, <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's something. So we have a question about salt from Stephanie. We know we should cut back on salt or should we omit it altogether? And how do you feel about miso? So salt is not a essential uh, thing to have in the salt. I'm talking added salt. I think we get enough salt from natural food that we don't have to have added salt. So salt is not necessary. All Americans, I would say not most, all Americans eat more salt than what's recommended. We need to eat less than 2.5 gram of salt. So we need to eat very low salt. So I said that salt should be lowered in everybody. 
try to keep below 2.5 gram. If you follow the sodium, because that's what's been in the, in the labels, then you should have a sodium 1500 milligram or less. And general rule is that if you look at any package item, if your sodium is as much or more than the calories, you should not be eating. So for example, if you have a 150 calorie item, and if the sodium is more than 150, you should not be eating because there is a lot of salt in there. Obviously, if you have a high blood pressure, this rule is very important because that means you should not be eating any salt. So salt is definitely not necessary. When you don't eat salt, sometimes you like to have some tasty food, you can use salt substitute, which is essentially potassium chloride. And it's very comes very close to salt-like test. Some people don't like potassium chloride salt substitute, but I've tried it and it, it's okay. I think some people like it, some people don't like it. They're in the market, you just try it, see what's good for you, what, what works for you. So, but if you have a kidney problem, don't try that because you will retain the potassium. And the other thing, which is important thing, I always recommend all my patients that if you go on a no salt diet, no salt, like I'm on no salt diet, then you may have to take iodine supplement because all of our iodine comes from iodized salt. So if you go on absolutely no salt diet, then you may have to take iodine supplement, which could be about 150 milligram. And you can get iodine supplement bottles. I take iodine supplement at least four or five times a week. So again, low salt and no salt is ideal. If you are a no salt, consider iodine supplement. Well, I don't have any salt since about 2008, and I just take some sea vegetables a few times a week. Yeah, the, the sea vegetables are perfect. Sea vegetables are perfect, yes. That's terrific. So what about people that think, well, red wine is good for the heart. It's got reverse, whatever that stuff is. Was I can never say words. Resveratrol or whatever. Resveratrol, yes, sir, yeah. I think, uh, I think the newest recommendation is no alcohol is the best, uh, best advice. No alcohol. At the same time, I think alcohol has been around for you know thousands of years. Many blue zone people who live 90, 100, live healthy, live long, they also are not totally zero alcohol. So I'm not against alcohol. So I think if you have a one glass of wine once or twice a week, I understand that. Obviously, alcohol carries a lot of calories. They're all empty calories. When you have more than a few drinks, your appetite goes up, your inhibitions go down, and you start eating very unhealthy food. And before you know, from the 200 calories of wine, you end up having 700 extra calories of unhealthy food. So not just alcohol itself, but what it brings. Just like when we eat animal products, it's not the animal protein, but what else it brings, including saturated fat, including cholesterol. So alcohol many times brings a lot of the bad actors with it. Obviously, a lot of alcohol is always bad for you. Nobody does that, fortunately. The people have learned the lessons from not drinking too much alcohol. But in my opinion, even a glass of wine is not necessary for heart prevention. There are a lot of other things you can do instead of drinking glass of wine. Terrific. Scott says... My friend AJ is one of the most progressive cardiologists in our country, and I've interviewed him on our longevity channel. A good question. How do we know if we have a heart risk before we have a cardiac event? Great question, Scott. That's a, that's a, that's a very great, very valid question because I think we all are learning now that being proactive in medicine is the best way to take care of yourself. You cannot wait for the event. Event actually many times is almost 30, 40, 50 years behind because we know from the Korean soldiers, we know from some of the people unfortunately who died into car accidents that the plaque buildup actually starts around age 10. So starting age 10, your arteries in the body starts having plaque buildup. So many times I tell my patients that now you're doing prevention, you need to also talk to your grandkids because your grandkids already, if they are 16, 17 year old, they already have some plaque buildup, some cholesterol streaks. So how can we know if they have cholesterol streaks or not? There are many tests you can do. Number one, like you, what you what you had, it, the carotid thing, you can look at your carotid intimal thickness, which is essentially the lining of the inside of the vessel. See if it's getting thick or not, that's a sign of a plaque buildup. You can do, we call coronary calcium scoring because whenever plaque builds up, plaque deposits calcium and that calcium scoring can be done. And we talked about it before, on his podcast that if your calcium scoring is zero, you have good chance you don't have any serious plaque. If your calcium scoring is above 400 and particularly about 1000, there are good chance you have multiple plaque buildup. So there are, there are some ways of knowing whether you already have plaque buildup before any event happens. 
You can always do obviously a stress test. If you're having any symptoms, then you will know that you have plaque or not. But I think the best way to know if you have plaque or not is by carotid intimal thickness, by calcium scoring of the coronary arteries. And uh, uh, if you're having symptoms, essentially doing a stress test. Right. You know, I didn't even ask you how you were. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, like, you, are you living now in a place where you're sheltering? Are you still able to work? Do you do telemedicine? Can you do consults for people that are interested? Yeah. So I would say uh, seventy percent of our visits are televisits now. And fortunately, we have a great video platform. So I almost feel like I'm in patients' uh, room. Matter of fact, Chef AJ. Many of these patients actually are feeling more comfortable because they're in their own home environment. They're holding their glass of coffee in their hand. Many times their dog is in their room. Many times their family is in their room. So they actually are much more receptive to my talk because they're in their own comfy environment. It's almost like hundreds of years ago when the doctor used to go to the patient's house for the visits and everything was just great feeling. So I, I feel like that feeling is coming back. Obviously, we do see some patients in the office where we need a physical exam. So my practice now is 70, 60, 70% televisits, 20% uh, uh, office visits, and 10% in the hospital. Uh, which, which brings up another point that we all know now that many of the patients over the last two months, unfortunately, have ignored their heart symptoms because they're afraid to come to the hospital because they think they will get uh, coronavirus. So they're afraid to come to the hospital. And many times they're ignoring actually real, true heart blockage symptoms. And many times I tell my patients that if you're having any chest pain, chest pain could, could harm you more than ever a coronavirus will harm you. So if you're having symptoms, don't wait until this corona crisis is over. All your cardiologists, all your primary care right away. And if you're having true, Emergency, like symptoms at rest, call 911. Don't worry about the COVID-19 or coronavirus because your heart attack can definitely harm you more than coronavirus can harm you. Isn't it true that in many people, the first symptom of heart disease is death? 10%, yes, Chef AJ, 10% of all people, the first symptom is death. And that statistics has not changed. So again, better, no symptoms. Because 10% mortality of any disease is very high mortality. So first symptom could be your last symptom. So I think not having any symptom is the best way to do it. And definitely don't ignore the symptom. Absolutely. People disagree on this, but we have to ask coffee. Good for the heart, bad for the heart, good for health, bad for health. I think coffee in general, uh, like, if you look at the data, coffee can prevent Parkinson's disease. Coffee also can prevent diabetes. There's some data. Coffee can also prevent certain cancers. You know, coffee can also prevent Alzheimer and certain dementia. So coffee has some data. A lot of those studies are, you know, biased at times. But at the same time, I think coffee goes along with the same, like what we talked about alcohol. If you have a one coffee in the morning, I'm not against it. If you have a decaf, that's even better. So I think coffee is okay. If you have a high blood pressure, and if you're trying to go off the medicine, maybe consider stopping coffee completely because coffee can raise your blood pressure. So if you're trying to achieve certain goals, going off coffee is fine. But if your blood pressure is normal, if your health is good, if you're following all lifestyle things, then having a, having a decaf coffee in the morning, I'm not against it. Matter of fact, a lot of the sleep uh, physicians who know everything about sleep themselves. They said that a decaf in the morning is safe thing to do. That's good to know. When you were talking about salt and you'd mentioned uh, potassium chloride, just as a chef, I can tell you, I don't care for it. I don't care for the taste. And I heard that it's not so good for you. I'm wondering, have you ever tried one of the salt-free seasonings like Benson's Table Tasty or local spicery that make just excellent spices with no salt? Yes, I think we have actually. I think because I used to have a high blood pressure, I don't anymore since I have exercised and lost weight and everything. So at our house, we don't put salt at all in my diet and we use a lot of seasoning. And fortunately, Indian cooking has a lot of other things which are just like the test, as tasty as salt. And I think we enjoy And I think what you said is so true. You just need, you just need to find what you like 
in terms of the seasoning, in terms of the certain spices you can, you know, I think, and then you will, you will not miss the salt. Matter of fact, to be honest with you, when I go to parties, Indian parties now, or anywhere I go, I actually feel like there's just so much salt. I almost complain. People say, but this is normal for us. So I agree. Once you develop the new test, you don't miss the salt. Absolutely. Well, Sharon says you sound like a wonderful doctor. Have you been able to convert your favorite recipes from India to whole food plant-based, no sugar, oil, or salt? Yes. Matter of fact, my wife, we've been married for 35 years. She actually is a great cook. And since I've become the lifestyle uh, proponent now at our home, everything is whole food, plant-based, no oil. And I think there are a lot of, lot of, and fortunately with uh, you know, Chef Ages uh, website, many of our cookbooks, many of the other YouTube videos now, we have definitely a lot of recipes available. And I think uh, initially it may become slightly different in terms of your taste, but I think in two or three weeks, your taste buds will adjust. As a matter of fact, not only you will start enjoying a new different taste, but actually you will start to feel good that you're taking care of your health. So I think many times, like, you know, we are, like a Daniel Ammon says that, the food, we doesn't love you back. How can you love that food? When you eat a whole food plant-based diet with no oil, you know that food is loving you back. So not only you get a good taste, but you also get the love from the food. Right. Uh, Sharon says, do you have any good Indian recipes? And people are wondering, is your wife going to write a cookbook? Uh, yeah, I think she's thinking about it. We have, we have started, again, I'm going to plug in something here. We have started this uh, hey, Facebook page called Healthy Living with Dr. Ajay Shah. Healthy Living with Dr. Ajay Shah. We I'll, I'll link to it. I'll get the link and I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. And we already have about 8,500 followers. And my wife is a big part of that. And we are starting to put many healthy Indian recipes, many even healthy American recipes, which has a, some Indian twist to it. So for example, my wife makes a great garbanjo based, uh, garbanjo bean dish, which actually we call chana or chana masala. Now she makes the one which almost has no oil in it. So I think to me, you can make a lot of the Indian dish without the oil. I'm not a great cook, but I think one day, hopefully, we'll bring our wife also. And she can also, you know, maybe we can just have an Indian cooking, healthy Indian cooking with no oil. And we can just discuss all those recipes. That sounds great. Do you know Chef Darshana Thacker? I've heard about her, yeah. Yeah, she's uh, with Forks Over Knives. She's the oh, culinary yeah, manager yeah, and she, yeah, she's yeah. Indian. She makes delicious yeah. food. This yeah. is an excellent question from yes. Gina. I've heard that heart attack warnings for women are different than in men. What do you feel the symptoms are that women should look for in a heart attack? And you can also talk about the ones that men. That's, uh, I, think, I think that's one of the most important questions tonight. Because the way I tell my patients that even if you are following the healthiest lifestyle, whole food, plant-based, no oil, exercise, sleep, everything else, there are always a small chance that you will develop heart blockage. So heart blockage are not 100% preventable. The goal here is not necessarily to heart blockage 100% prevent it, but to know when the symptoms happen. In women, symptoms are many times different. In men, for example, typically they will get crushing chest pain, chest pressure, radiating to their left arm on exertion. That's a classic pain of a heart blockage. In women, many times they will not get chest pain. They will get short of breath, so their breath will be slightly short when they walk. They will get fatigued. They will just say, I'm just been tired lately. They will get many times back pain. Many times they will get jaw pain. Many times they will get upper belly pain. Many times they will get essentially like a not healthy feeling. And so women's symptoms are much more different. So again, women should look out for shortness of breath, tired feeling, uh, back pain, uh, pain in the upper belly, almost like they're having a gallbladder pain, but that could be a heart pain. The good thing, good rule of thumb is that if you are having any symptoms with exertion and going away with rest, for example, if you walk or jog or on a bike, and if you develop any symptoms in chest, in belly, in back, and five minutes after you stop what you're doing, and if it goes away, watch out, because that could be a sign of heart blockage. That's a very important question. So many women, unfortunately, you know, lately less, but when I was in training 25, 30 years ago, many women came sometimes day or two late 
after they already had a heart attack because they thought it was their back, it was their gallbladder, it was their stomach, they thought it was the reflux. So if you're having any symptoms on exertion, don't wait. You're so right, because when my mom had her heart attack, it was basically, she was just nauseous and she couldn't sleep. And it's a good thing we went to the hospital because yeah. she had yes. that heart attack. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So when you transitioned to a plant-based diet, did your wife just immediately say, okay, or was it, did, did she hold out for a bit? No, actually she, she came on board pretty much overnight. And I think, uh, I think part of it, because uh, to give you my story, I, my A1C, the marker for diabetes had gone up to 5.9. So I was almost becoming pre-diabetic and my family has diabetes in India, even though they're all vegetarian. So I did not want to ever become diabetic. So I woke up that day. I overnight became a whole food plant-based, started walking, uh, started sleeping better. My A1C, last A1C just a month ago was 5.2. I reversed it by 0.7. My A1C actually is better than our son. So, I mean, that's a great feeling. So again, I think I woke up, I ran with it, and any patient, any person who is listening this uh, live right now, any person can do that. You know, start small. You know, I always said that you cannot do overnight like I did. I had a great motivation of A1C of 5.9, but start small. Many patients ask me that, how can I become whole food plant-based person? I said, keep eating any animal products for breakfast or lunch or dinner. Just have one meal like that. After a week or two, make it two meals. After a month, try to make it a third meal and have only one or twice a week a meat-based product. And once you change your test first, eventually, and once you start feeling better, you actually automatically will avoid animal products. So again, animal products, people have attachments to them. Many times people are sold that you should have enough animal products to have protein and many other things. So people need to change, but the change can happen slowly. We cannot make people overnight like I was able to do it. Wonderful. Nana says, my blood pressure is usually around 154. Is that still in the normal range? Well, then I should ask you if this is in the normal range because my doctors are always ragging on me to eat salt. <laughs> but I feel, I feel fine. Why should, I mean, yeah. is it, I haven't dropped dead yet. So why? <laughs> no, no, I think, uh, again, that's another important question. Today, we got some great questions. So blood pressure should be below 120 or 80. We used to think blood pressure of 140 or 80. 85 is okay, but now we have enough proof that 140 is not good. People who were blood pressure was 140 versus 120, they had more stroke and more heart attacks. So 140 no longer is the recommended number. The number is 120. At the same time, the rule, the rule with two things, sugar and the blood pressure, lower the better until you black out. So if your blood pressure is 77, like Chef AJ, and if she's talking with this great sense, that's a perfect blood pressure, lower the better. If somebody's sugar is 75, if they're talking perfectly fine, that's a perfect sugar. So again, for sugar and for the blood pressure, lower the better, as long as you don't black out. So 154 for her is high. If she goes on no salt, a very low salt diet, if she has uh, any weight to lose, if she starts eating a whole food plant-based diet, her blood pressure will normalize. I used to be on two blood pressure medicine, now I'm on zero blood pressure medicine. Cut the caffeine or keep the caffeine zero, cut the alcohol, improve the sleep, and I can assure you her blood pressure will normalize with or without medicine in three months. Great. I keep posting the link to your Facebook page and people are saying that they've joined. So please go there and, and like you. it. And Thank then uh, Stephanie says she found you on Instagram at Healthy Recipes with Dr. With, with Dr. AJ Shah. So we'll Thank send you. people over there as yeah. well. Thank you. So uh, let's see, I have a question from Dana. What do you think of Lipitor for a woman who is plant-based, no sugar, oil, salt, who has less than 50 blockages in one artery with no symptoms? Maybe she means 50% blockages because 50 yes. blockages sound like a lot of blockages. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So first thing is, what is her cholesterol? I would keep her LDL, the bad cholesterol, around 70. So if LDL, the bad cholesterol is above 70, then Lipitor is a fair call. At the same time, Lipitor could be a transition drug. If she completely optimize, completely optimize her whole food plant-based, no oil diet, and get to the BMI of 21, 22, keep the calorie, whatever, keep the BMI around 21, 22, 
If a LDL comes down below 70, below 80, and like we talked earlier, if a marker of inflammation it comes down to low level, then obviously Lipitor can be off. But once you have any plaque buildup, most cardiologists would say Lipitor to keep LDL around 70 is a fair call. That's great. Missy says, do you feel that the only treatment for blockages is stent or bypass, or can one reverse a blockage or prevent further blockage with a whole food plant-based diet? Again, that's another important question. And the information on this question is not recent. It's actually 30 years old, 30 years old. Din Ornish in 91 proved that simple eating healthy, whole food plant-based, walking 30 minutes, three times a week, not smoking, uh, ex uh, lowering the stress and doing some meditation can actually not only stabilize the blockage, but can reverse the blockage. Since then, we had two major trials over the last 10 years. One just came out last year that even people who have blockage, even if they're having some exertional symptoms, if they go on a medical therapy, a medical therapy included a whole food plant-based, no oil diet. Some of them were on statins. Some of them were on other medications like beta blocker. They actually did as good as having stent or a bypass. So as long as your symptoms are exertional and you are willing to put 100% efforts into lifestyle change. And if many of our listeners remember, uh, Nathan Pritikin, Nathan Pritikin from 50 years back, not only reversed his own blockage, he lived long. A matter of fact, he set up the centers, but a lot of the people who go to those centers, they actually reverse the blockage, stabilize the blockage and live long. And Michael Greger, Dr. Greger, you know, our favorite person in this world, his grandma, who was told that go home and die at like 62 years old, not only she lived up to 94, she was able to walk like five or seven miles when she was 80 years old. And she had a multiple, multiple blockages. So we have many examples, not just one you know, example, but we have many trials now done where you can actually reverse the blockage, stabilize the blockage, prevent the heart attack with whole food, plant-based diet, with regular exercise, and all the six pillars of lifestyle. Great. Alka says, what is your opinion regarding the keto diet? Keto diet is going to kill more people than any other thing ever invented. Keto is going to kill more than what atomic bombs kill in 1942 or 45. So keto is bad. Keto is bad. Keto is nothing but Atkins stand with new clothes. Keto is the one which promotes a lot of animal products, a lot of saturated fat. LDL, the bad cholesterol goes up. We don't have a long-term data on keto. And actually, if we remember, all the long living people, including all the blue zone people, typically their diet is carbohydrate dominant diet. Most diet in the blue zone Carbohydrates are 70, 80%. Some blue zones have about 50%, but definitely no below 50% in all blue zones. Most blue zones have carbohydrate. They're obviously all complex carbohydrate, whole food, plant-based diet, a lot of sweet potatoes and other things. So again, carbohydrate diet always has shown to prolong the life and make people healthy. Keto diet recommends ultra low carb, which just doesn't make sense. So I think in my opinion, no keto ever. I love that. I wrote that down. The keto diet is going to kill more people than anything ever invented. And may I quote you on that? Yeah, yeah. That's terrific. Well, on Monday, I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Kim, Kim Williams, the former president of the American College of Cardiology, who is known for saying there are two types of cardiologists, vegan or those who haven't read the data. I would argue that there's two types of doctors. So yes. why do you think that cardiologists just aren't embracing this the way so many of the plant-based cardiologists are? I think uh, partly the knowledge base, partly they have not had experience with plant-based diet, partly doctors themselves are not doing it, partly they don't get paid. If I put a stent, I get paid $1,000. If I talk to somebody for 45 minutes about their eating, I get $30. So obviously, I don't say all doctors are in doing it for the money reason, but obviously there's always some, you know, kind of uh, uh, some motivation which has to do with the money. Plus, our insurance companies and Medicare still doesn't realize that coaching and counseling has a value. And I think once we start to realize, once we start to get paid, and I think fortunately, doctors are coming on board. So again, I see hope 
I see many of my interventional cardiologists who I refer patients to now, they are coming on board. Matter of fact, they are asking me, how can they be lifestyle certified? So hang in tight. I think in five years, we'll have a lot more cardiologists on board with our movement. That's wonderful. Florence says, can you comment on chelation therapy or chelation therapy? I yeah, chelation. Chelation therapy has some small data and it has shown some benefit in people who already have bypass surgery. I think in general, I don't recommend chelation therapy. Chelation therapy has a lot of side effects. Wherever it's performed, it's not performed under standard conditions. It's very expensive at times. So I think in general, I don't recommend anybody chelation therapy. At the same time, even NIH has looked into chelation trials. And there are some small data that after bypass surgery, chelation may have some benefits, but I think in general, chelation has not been done. Like none of my patients get chelation. None of the doctors I work get chelation. So I would say no to chelation. Very good. So what do you eat every day? And how much do you exercise? We love to know what you do personally. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm an extreme, like you are, Chef AJ. So my steps, any guess on my steps for this year? You mean per day? Per day. I'm going to say 18,000. 19,000. It's a great pretty guess. pretty close. Yeah. And any guess on what Americans walk every day? How many steps? Maybe two? 4,000. Oh. Because 19,000 steps is three and a half hour of walking. You walk about 6,000 steps an hour. So every day I walk about uh, eight or nine miles every day. I sleep seven hour, 20 minutes because my Fitbit tracks it. My sleep is very deep sleep, good RAM sleep. I eat whole food plant-based as much as possible. I think the, the six pillars, the missing links so far has been my diet. I enjoy food. My wife makes a great food. We follow whole food, plant-based, no oil as much as possible, but I could be better. I think exercise has become second nature to me. Sleep has been great. Diet is the hardest part. At the same time, I realize diet probably is the most important part. So do you, what do you say to a patient that's doing it, but maybe isn't seeing the results that so many others do or get discouraged? Do you think that they're really doing it 100% or sometimes is it like Dr. Walter Kempner says, all dieters are liars? <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think there are parameters you can follow. Obviously, get on the scale every morning because if you're eating whole food, plant-based, no oil diet, like Dr. Joe Furman says, that you will gravitate towards your ideal body weight you will start melting away all the extra pounds which your body doesn't need. You don't have to worry about how much quantity of food you eat. If you eat whole food, plant-based, no oil diet, your weight will start coming down. So if your weight is coming down, if your waist diameter is coming down, don't get discouraged because you may not get all the benefits and results right away. But if you're getting your weight down, if your waist diameter is getting down, if your information is going down, if your sleep is getting better, if your mood is getting better, people are telling you you're looking better, you're more productive, your diet is working. So I think uh, obviously diet requires time. Like I said, diet may take three to six months to see all the benefits. Just hang in there. At the same time, I think, uh, I think to me, knowledge is power. I, I still, even at this stage, I still read many success stories from the whole food plant-based diet because then I can relate that that person who was doing those whole food plant-based no oil took eight months to get to the goal. Maybe I need eight months also. So reading other people's success story is also very important. Then you realize that this requires some time. It's not gonna happen overnight. Terrific. Well, I just think you're wonderful. So does everybody else. I wish we had doctors like you here where I live. I mean, there's nice doctors, but they're not plant-based and they're you know, oh, thank you. Not, not, definitely not cardiologists. Any chance to come out to California? I think I will. Definitely. I'm, I'm going to see you in person next time. I better we go to a meeting together. I'm going to yeah. stop by and say hello to you. Absolutely. But I'll make you let dinner. Me, let, me, let me tell you one thing. You look great. You look absolutely great. You look 20 years younger than your age, because I know your age. So that's a, just an amazing feeling. You're doing a wonderful job. This is such a dedication. This is a service. I think we all live life with purpose, meaning, and pleasure. And I think, fortunately, you have found your pleasure. And you have found your purpose and meaning. So we need more people like you, more people well, with the same you. first name. 
Thank you. And what I tell you, the first name's got it. AJs are awesome. Well, same here. Carol, other people are saying, I wish this man was my cardiologist. Thank you so much for your purpose, your passion. And I'm, I keep posting the link to your Facebook page, hoping that everybody that watches yes. live in the replay will like your page so that more people can know about you. And I'm so glad you reached out to me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you from one AJ to another. Take Thank care. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.